You didn't do anything to aid in her death, no. but you didn't do anything to stop her from dying. I really didn't. Yeah. I mean, I just watched it happen. On December 3, 1998, a terrible accident occurred, taking the life of Julie Jensen, who was 40 years old. Her husband, Mark Jensen, 39, was left devastated by the tragedy. At first, everyone thought that July had killed herself, which made her family very sad. Then, a letter came out of the grave. You know, she contacts us a few days before she turns up dead, and she leaves us this letter. Okay, then all of a sudden, boom, she is dead. This letter took the investigation in a completely different way. What really happened when Julie died, and how did a letter come out of her grave? Hi and welcome back to our channel. If you are new here, please consider subscribing, as it helps us motivate to create more intriguing content for you. Let's have a look at the case of Julie Jensen. Pleasant Prairie is a charming town in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. It is in the middle of the Chicago to Milwaukee corridor on the shore of Lake Michigan. There are many parks, wildlife preserves, and hiking trails for locals and tourists to enjoy. The Pleasant Prairie premium outlets have over 90 high-end stores, which makes them a famous place for people who like to shop. With all of these things, it is clear that Pleasant Prairie is a unique and attractive place to live. It is busy in the summer but empty when winter comes. But no one in this peaceful Wisconsin town was ready for what happened in early December 1998. Julie Jensen's parents were Raymond Griffin and June Constance Hackard. Julie was the only girl in the family with six boys. Richard, one of her brothers, died in 1957 just a year before Julie was born. But she got to grow up with her other four brothers named Larry, Michael, Paul, and Patrick. Julie was the only girl in a family of five boys. As the star of the family, her brothers looked out for her. Even though there were seven people in the Griffin family, Raymond's job at a company that made cars made sure that they had everything they needed. On the other hand, Julie stayed at home to take care of her five children. Julie and her siblings grew up in a religious home, so they went to church and Sunday school every week. This helped Julie's faith in God even more. She always cared about her family and treated people older than her with respect. People who knew and liked July would say she was kind, easygoing, honest, and happy. Julie went to different schools in Kenosha County as she grew up, but she kept her image as a good student all through middle school and high school. She also sang in the church band when she was not in school. July finished from high school in 1976 and went on to study nursing at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. She also worked part-time in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, at a Sears shop. She thought that her faith in God would lead her to the road that was best for her, whether it was faith or fate. She did meet the man she thought she would spend the rest of her life with. In 1981, when Julie was 23 years old and going to college, she started dating Mark Jensen, a student who was a year younger than her. Mark finished college with all of his credits and became a stockbroker. On the other hand, Julie dropped out when she was only one term away from getting her degree. She did not have any trouble with her studies, but because of her job, she had to keep a close eye on the patients, which was hard on her mind. She left when she realized that the field of nursing was not quite right for her. She was excited to start a new part of her life. In 1984, Mark and July got married and moved to the Carroll Beach neighborhood of Pleasant Prairie. Mark went to work in business to support the family while Julie stayed at home. During the first few years of their marriage, they were perfect together. David was born in 1990. He was Mark and July's first child. Mark took care of their finances, and July focused on their son's health and happiness. In 1995, just a few years later, Mark and Julie gave birth to their second boy, Douglas. Their boys were the most important things in their lives, and July and Mark did things like fishing, camping, and swimming with them to spend time with them. The Jensens also got along well with their neighbors. They had many get-togethers, dinners, and pool parties at their house. Julie, who was known as a nice person, liked going to a book club for women with some of her neighbors. But above all else, 
her top concern was taking care of her husband and two sons. David was eight years old in 1998, and Douglas was only three. Julie worked part-time for the Chicago Port Authority, and Mark Jensen ran the Stifle Nicholas office in Racine, Washington. Julie also volunteered at Southport Elementary School, where David was in the third grade, where she worked as a secretary. Mark and Julie Jensen seemed to have it all on the outside. They had a steady income, a nice house, a comfortable boat, and two beautiful children who went on trips with them more than once. No one could have seen the nightmare that would change their lives forever or the letter from the dead that came after it. If you have made it this far in the video and are thinking if a letter coming out of the grave is too strange, we promise that it is worth staying until the end to learn more about this interesting topic. On December 3, 1998, Mark Jensen made a distress call to 911, informing them that his wife Julie Jensen was not breathing. Responding to the call, Officer Laura Hoffman and Sergeant Dan Riley from the Pleasant Prairie Police Department arrived at the Jensen residence at 9020 Lakeshore Drive at 4.35 p.m. When they walked into the house, they saw Mark Jensen in the kitchen trying to use his phone while he looked upset. He pointed down the hall when they asked where his wife was. At the end of the hallway, they went into Julie's bedroom, where she was lying on her stomach with part of her face under a pillow. It was clear that she had left a long time ago, so the cops called for help to collect forensic evidence. But the police could not find any clear signs that she was dead. Around her body, there were no stab wounds, gunshot wounds, or battery wounds. When they looked through the house, they did not find anything else that seemed odd. But she was 40 years old and in good health, so it did not seem likely that she died of natural causes. As Julie's body was being transported to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy, officers initiated a line of questioning with Mark regarding the incident. The relevant authorities were urged by the interrogator to be contacted. In response to the police, it was explained by Mark that no actions were taken by him to cause harm to Julie. He mentioned that there had been an argument between him and their child that morning regarding whether or not to call an ambulance. Julie's breathing displayed abnormalities, and she had not even gotten out of bed at that point. The situation was described as immensely distressing. According to Mark, July had explicitly instructed him not to call anyone on Wednesday morning. He questioned if she had wished to die, as she had specifically asked him not to seek help or disclose the matter to anyone. Mark attested that he observed Julie make no effort to obtain food or take any actions to prevent her own death. However, he believed that someone else was responsible for the unfortunate incident, emphasizing that he was present and witnessed the events unfold. When Mark sent his kids to school that day, he told them that if Julie did not feel better by the time they got home, he would take her to the hospital. Sadly, the kids would never see their mother alive and well again. Mark said that Julie was still in bed when he picked up his kids from school that afternoon. Julie's family was told about the tragedy, and her four brothers were devastated by the news. Investigators did not know what caused Julie's death, and they hoped that reports from the autopsy would help them figure it out. Unfortunately, the first autopsy report did not give a cause of death. However, a toxicology report later showed that Julie died of ethylene glycol poisoning which is often used as antifreeze. The tests conducted on her blood, kidneys, and stomach revealed that she had ingested at least two doses of ethylene glycol, with the final dose administered shortly before her death. At this point, investigators think that July took her own life, but they wanted to be sure, so they dug deeper into the lives of Mark and Julie Jensen. They soon found that things were not what they seemed to be on the surface. Detectives found out that Mark and July's marriage started to have problems in the early 1990s, right after David was born. Like many other women who had just given birth, Julie developed postpartum depression, which was so bad that she had to see a therapist named Paul DeFazio. During therapy, DeFazio learned about Julie's troubled family background. For example, her mother was depressed and an alcoholic her whole life, and her brother Patrick tried to kill himself when he was only 17. 
Julie also told DeFazio that she did not like being a homemaker, felt like she had to do extra work for the baby, and had dark thoughts about killing herself. She was put on antidepressants, and DeFazio thought everything would get back to normal. During this hard time, Julie had a brief affair with a co-worker named Perry Turica. They met at the financial firm where they both worked. One weekend when Mark was out of town, Julie invited Turica to her house for dinner. He ended up staying the whole weekend, and the two of them slept together. Turica liked Julie and wanted to keep dating her, but Julie ended the relationship, cut off all ties with them, and even quit her job. Julie moved on with her life, but she could not get rid of the guilt. In 1991, not long after David was born, Julie told Mark about her brief affair with Turica. Mark agreed to forget about it, but the incident put a permanent strain on their relationship. After that, Mark became paranoid and could not trust Julie. Things got so bad that Julie filed for divorce, but she did not go through with it. Regularly, explicit photos were sent to the Mark's place of work. Julie also got harassing calls from an unknown source, but no one knew who was behind these cruel jokes. Mark had a feeling that Perry Turica was behind it all, but Julie was not sure about anything, and her emotions were not ready to deal with it all. The Jensens went to the police in 1993 because they had been getting harassing phone calls and photos for years. Officer Ronald Cosman of the Pleasant Prairie Police Department was looking into the case, but he could not find anyone to blame. He even tapped Julie's phone four times, but each time the calls stopped, they started up again later as Julie tried to get back to her normal life. Mark and Julie had their second child in 1995. They may have done this to fix their relationship since children often bring people closer. Instead, they grew further apart while trying to fix their broken hearts. Julie's emotions were out of control, and the fact that she and Mark did not trust each other did not help. Her unstable marriage often reminded her of her unhappy childhood, and her biggest fear was turning out like her mother. So, even though she was having a hard time, she did not drink which may have pushed her further away from Mark. Julie told many of her friends that Mark wanted her to drink with them in the evenings and stay out late. This history of a bad marriage gave investigators more reason to think that Julie probably killed herself. But in a shocking turn of events, even stranger stories came to light which changed the way the case went. Mark got close to Kelly Labonte, a co-worker at the financial firm where he worked. Even though Mark was married to Julie and Kelly was engaged to someone else, they had an affair in the months before Julie died. Mark and Kelly exchanged countless flirtatious emails, all the while keeping it a secret from their spouses. The more Mark fancied being with Kelly, the more he saw Julie as the thorn in his side. On the other hand, Julie noticed the change in Mark. Though the marriage was always troubled, in 1998 Julie felt it was changing for the worse. Though most of the friends of the Jensen family were unaware of their tumultuous relationship, she confided in some of her close friends from the book club and one of her son's teachers that she was extremely fearful of Mark. She even speculated that Mark might have been plotting to kill her. When her friends suggested divorce, July told them that Mark would kill her before he divorced her. She also suggested that staying with Mark was best for their sons, so her friends did not intervene any further. Despite the danger she perceived, she still felt a sense of loyalty and obligation to her husband and his children. She was struggling to find a way to cope with the overwhelming feelings of depression, anxiety, and fear that were consuming her as the situation worsened. Mark may not have been the best husband for Julie, but her brothers were shocked when he did not even honor her last wish. Julie had wanted to be buried next to her dead brother Richard, but Mark cremated her without telling the family. This was a big blow to them, so it is no surprise that they started to question Mark's motives. Neighbors also told police that a week after Julie's funeral, they saw Mark throwing away what looked like Julie's things at the dump. All signs pointed to Mark Jensen, but feelings are not evidence that can be used in court, and the evidence detectives gathered by talking to many people and digging deeper into the relationship was only circumstantial. Julie's next-door neighbors and friends, Ted, and Margaret White 
gave the police a sealed package with a letter from the grave. They said that just before she died, Julie gave them the package and told them to only give it to the police if something bad happened to her. Mark worked at a business company with Kelly. Despite being almost 10 years younger than Mark, Kelly was under Mark's authority at work. Mark wanted to be with Kelly more and more, but Julie kept getting in the way. Julie went to see Dr. Richard Borman, who is the family doctor for the Jensens. Borman saw that she was in a bad mood and gave her Paxil, which is an antidepressant, and Ambien, which is a sleep aid. Mark told several people in the weeks before Julie Jensen's death that she was unhappy and thinking about killing herself. He also said that she had lost a lot of weight. These facts were shocking for detectives. While they were trying to find out the truth about Mark and Julie's relationship, other scary things were happening. On the funeral, Mark supposedly did not show any sadness and even laughed and made jokes. Later, one of Julie's friends said that Mark Jensen was not as sad about the death of a stranger as he was about the death of his wife. The inspectors had a hard time getting solid proof, but then a damning piece of evidence came from a place they never would have thought to look. The proof came in the form of a letter from the grave, a sealed package that Ted and Margaret White, Julie's next-door neighbors and friends, gave to the police. When Julie sent a package to some close friends, it contained a letter and a picture that pointed to a scary truth. This was a shocking turn in the investigation. Julie's words from the afterlife showed that she was afraid of her husband and that she thought he might try to hurt her. The shocking things in the letter showed how much Julie loved her children and how her relationship with Mark had been stressed by an affair she had with someone else. Experts in handwriting confirmed that the letter was real and they called it the letter from the grave. While the police kept this important piece of evidence hidden for a while, other information that pointed to the killer came to light. On the family computer, investigators found some troubling web searches, such as ones about poisons and other dangerous things. Julie's voicemails to a police officer showed that she was worried about her safety and wanted a probe if something bad happened to her. According to forensic reports, Julie's cause of death was determined to be both suffocation and poisoning. This led police to think that Mark had been slowly poisoning her before suffocating her. During his interrogation, Mark constantly denied that he had anything to do with his wife's death. But investigators showed him the proof, like the letter and photos of Julie's body, which pointed to him as the killer. Mark kept saying he was not guilty, no matter what they did. Julie's family and friends had different thoughts about the case. Some people thought Mark was to blame, but Mark's own family had a different idea. They said that Julie was a trained nurse and she knew about drugs and poisons. People thought she set up a plan to frame Mark so she could get custody of their kids. They said that Julie got the dose wrong and accidentally killed herself. As the police looked into Mark, they did not find enough physical proof to charge him with murder. But the letter could not be shown in court because the law said the accused had to face the person who said bad things about them. Even though it was hard, detectives kept looking for strong evidence against Mark. Mark moved on with his life, and in a surprise turn of events, married another woman and moved to Wisconsin. Prosecutors charged him with first-degree murder in 2002, almost four years after Julie's death. Long court battles were fought over whether or not the letter and voicemails could be used. In 2007, the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that they could be used. Mark Jensen's trial started in 2008, and the defense said July was mentally unstable and killed herself while framing her husband out of revenge. On the other hand, the prosecutor said Mark had both a reason and a chance to kill her. Witnesses, such as Julie's neighbors and friends, said that she was afraid of Mark. Mark's former co-worker said in court that he heard Mark talking about killing his wife, which was shocking. Also, two other prisoners said that Mark had admitted to them while he was in jail. The things they said matched what the medical inspector found. After days of deliberation, the jurors found Mark guilty, and he will spend the rest of his life in prison without the chance to get out. Julie's family and friends had suffered for years, and the decision gave them some sense of justice. But the story did not end there. Mark got a new trial, 
because the judge ignored Julie's letter, which was against his rights. At his second trial, the prosecution focused on other strong pieces of evidence, which led to another guilty decision. Mark was given a term of life in prison without the chance of getting out. This put an end to a long and painful chapter. Julie and Mark's two boys were caught in the middle of their parents' troubled relationship and the legal battle that followed. This was very hard on them. They had to face the heartbreaking truth of losing their mother and seeing their father accused and convicted of killing her. The trial and its effects were hard on the family. The attention from the media and the public only made their pain worse. Julie's family and friends thought that justice had been done and agreed with the prosecution's version of what happened. They hoped that the conviction would give them peace of mind and let them remember July without a cloud of doubt over her. Mark's family never stopped believing that he was innocent. The whole time he was in court, they stood by him and said he was wrongly accused and sentenced. The fights between members of the family made their relationships even worse and left scars that would take years to heal. During the years that followed, both families tried to move on while dealing with sadness, loss, and broken relationships. The case had an effect on more than just the close family and friends. It sent shockwaves through the community and started conversations about domestic violence, betrayal, and the complexities of criminal justice. The Mark Jensen case is a frightening reminder of how fragile trust is in relationships and how terrible things can happen when that trust is broken. It is a cautionary tale that tries to get people to talk about how common domestic violence is and try to make safer places for people who are in violent relationships. People who knew and cared about Julie Jensen will always remember her, and the case will always be a lesson of how important it is to seek justice and protect the weak. Legal experts, psychologists, and people who are interested in the details of criminal cases and trials continue to study and analyze them. The Mark Jensen case is still a scary story of suspicion and betrayal. It has left an indelible mark on the community and is a sobering reminder of what can happen when people act out of rage, jealousy, or a lack of care for other people's lives. Thanks for watching.